Well, the bull market in the S&P and the NASDAQ continues to soldier on. We've got good gains coming through in Apple and NVIDIA, which are underpinning the move we've been seeing as well, backed up by some further moves coming through in Microsoft as well. Now, we've just been treated to a very pleasing US CPI print, but one swallow certainly doesn't make a summer. And as we've seen from the Fed meeting, they're not getting carried away at the moment and they are trying to put a lid on the euphoria seen in markets. Now with the non-farm payrolls, US CPI and Fed meeting out of the way, we've got a bit of a vacuum. How do we trade these markets as a result? That's what we're going to look to assess in the trade-off. Well, hello, I'm Chris Weston, Head of Research here at Pepstone, and I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. I've got my Christmas jumper on today for no reason whatsoever. Uh, we've got Blake Morrow fresh, freshly out of the barbershop looking absolutely smick. We've got these markets, which are all over the place. We're going to make sense of them. Mr. Blake Morrow coming to the programme. How are you feeling after that? Uh, after the CPI print and the Fed meeting? And Oh, Jesus, you are looking sharp. Oh, thank you very much. I like the, I like the Christmas jumper, by the way, Chris. <laughs> and... Um, I uh, I left my neck brace. It's actually sitting on my desk next next to me, and uh, I took it off for the show. So, oh, well, good work. <laughs> anyway, like, I reckon this. Uh, you know, this the Fed meeting was interesting. I think everyone's looking at it in different ways. Obviously, CPI can only be fo focused in one point. So let's go straight into it, shall we? Let's let's go dive right into your thoughts in the market pulse. We are in the scrummage point of the show and I want to dissect really the CPI print and the Fed meeting. Now the CPI print I don't think you can really look at it any other way than that was a, a very positive outcome. You can look at the super core number which is um, core services ex shelter, ex, ex rents um, and that actually fell for the first time in two, two, two years. That was a very you know, good good outcome there. Core services you know, were essentially cut in half in terms of the run rate and for me Blake one of the most important situations now we take the components from the CPI print, um, we put them into the PCE calculation which comes out in the 28th of June. We're going to get the PPI components in the session ahead. But the run rate at the moment is that the PCE, obviously, which the Fed sets policy, is running around 0.16 of 1% month on month and 2.6% year on year. That's a very pleasing rate indeed. Um, but the CPI number is obviously very strong. Then we had the Fed meeting coming out shortly afterwards. Uh, how do we go about dissecting this? We've seen a bit of a whippy ride, certainly CPI very pleasing to Marcus. How have you, how have you read this whole situation? Well, well, first of all, that CPI print was awesome. I was really hoping that, um, you know, at the FOMC, we would have had a more dovish F uh, Fed uh, meeting, which would have really sent the dollar reeling. I mean, the dollar just really probed really critical support. You had the, you know, you had the euro back at above 108.50. You had sterling at 128. You had uh, the Aussie dollar was trading at 67 cents. Everything looked like it was poised to just move. And then wah, wah, wah. Then we had the <laughs> Fed. So, um, and and I, I, I walked away from the Fed. Let me just say this. I walked away thinking, I don't see a rate cut coming. When he said, this, is, this was a good development. Today was a great development, but we're going to need to see more. That told me at that moment in time, we're, we're not getting a cut anytime in let the near future. Question. If you let guys me, think, let me, let me jump in quick because yeah, go ahead. One of the big talking points was that um, yeah, you know, Powell mentioned that the Fed had the chance um, to incorporate the the weaker CPI into their thought process, and, and few decided to do it. You know, so with 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 basically most of the Fed not incorporating this weak CPI number in, and the PCE number into their forecast. The dots go to one, one cup for this year. We, we push them out for four next year. But are they stale? Are, 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 you know, are, are the, are, are Fed should have marked to market that CPI print. Is, is there, are, they, are they behind the curve there? Well, that that was a really weird response when he said, well, we got the data and we gave governors an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to change their dots. And he's like, I think a couple of them did. And I was like, what? <laughs> like really that's that that's exactly that's a great question chris are they stale M maybe but he did reiterate this is a good start or i don't know if he said it's a good start but he said this is good yeah i want to see more yeah. and that tells me we're probably going to need months of pleasing data yeah. in order for him to well one thing I, yeah, one thing i took out right is that 
They, they've, re- they've kept their un- unemployment rate for this year unchanged at 4%. We're actually at 4% already. They've revised their core PCE forecast to 2.8% for the end of the year. We're likely to get it at 2.6% below. It does suggest to me, from, from the SEP point of view, that the bar to cutting is actually fairly low, which suggests to me that, that when we go into the, the June data series, so we've got payrolls coming through on the 5th of July, and then we've got the CPI print, which everyone's going to be talking about on the 11th of July. Um, if they come in, if we, if we see the unemployment rate ticking above, you know, above 4.1%, and we see another pleasing CPI print, then September's open, right? Or, or are we looking at December? Oh, I think September is still open, but I'm I'm I still 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 believe that because of the the heated political environment that we're going to be in here in the U.S., we already we're already there already, but it's going to get even more heated. Uh, I don't know how they're going to move in September. I still I can't get over that hump. I can't get over the hump that they won't just be destroyed from a you know, from a from a uh, respectability point of view, if they make a move in September, but I don't know, Chris. I, so you know, going into rates, yeah. You know, even if they cut now, or they cut in September, or they cut in December, how much does it matter? I mean, <laughs> I don't think I don't think the equity market needs a rate cut. I really don't. I think the fact that we've got if we got a continuation of what we got at the moment going forward, which is a, a fairly okay economy, some calling in the labour market. I know the, the establishment survey was very, very hot, uh, but the, the household survey is weakening with the jolts numbers have been weakening. You know, various factors are suggesting you know, some, some changes are ha- afoot in the, in the labour market. But as long as it happens, I don't think we necessarily need to see rate cuts. Um, the Fed just need to say that they're they're prepared to cut rates is is probably enough for the for you know Nvidia and, and Apple and everything to continue, you know, soldiering on and people chasing that move. But I think at some stage, um, you know, you want to you want to see a real effort to to, to to ease rates. Now, like, I think the interesting thing is I talked about those event risks. Um, if CPI comes out in the next print, yeah, point two of a percent, you know, then I think the market will price in a a, a cut in September as a lock. I think yeah, we're at sixty percent now of implied. So yeah, get another number there, and I think September's on the card. What would happen to then? To your point, is that Jerome Powell would have to sell it to the world. You know, this is why we're going to be cutting. They'd have to change the tune. They'd have to give a lot of runway into that meeting, so as not to get the the, the Trumps of this world saying you're overly politicised. So, you know, if the date is there, the unemployment rate showing chinks of, of cracking. That that now we get another CPI print. Um, then I think he may start to prepare the market uh, for a September cut. But yeah, I think there's. I don't think we need them. What do you think? No, I, I actually don't. And, and and one one point I want to make before we 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 need to really, like really talk about the leadership of the market right now is that that there's so many macroeconomists, and I hear these podcasts all the time of people that just say, well, you know, the market typically goes down when when the Fed starts cutting. Hmm. I don't. I'm not in that camp, Chris. Not in this situation. But it goes down when they're, it's cutting they're, when they're having to stimulate because they're going into recession. Right. If we're just easing back to a more neutral capacity and less restrictive, um, I don't think that's too bad. But it's when they start to stimulate because they need to. That's when the equity market says earnings are falling. You know, they're 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 Correct. chasing the tail. There's a difference between not all rate cuts are created equally. Let's go into the Nasdaq because Apple came out with their worldwide development conference. The market sold the fact on the day, then bang, up she goes, as everyone says, we're going to get an upgrade cycle because all these new features are basically going to begin the iPhone 15. We're going to all be buying iPhone 15s in the future. So upgrade cycles, better earnings. We love Apple as a result. We're chasing that one. NVIDIA has found a love. I actually thought the Fed meeting, as a, I think everyone's saying it's hawkish. It was bullish for the market, in my opinion. They kept a lid on euphoria, but they're still very much open to the prospect uh, of cuts coming forward. That's all we need to know. So we're chasing. We're chasing tech. We, we are. We are. And look, I, I'm going to. I'm going to tell you this much. I'm on an upgrade cycle. Everybody in the United States, most people are on an upgrade cycle with Apple. I'll have a new Apple iPhone when this uh, Apple Intelligence comes out. It's not that big of a deal. It's, it's not so, like what a crap name. AI, Apple intelligence, it's, it's awful. It's, it's, it's silly. But there are certain people that are maybe of my mom's age that are like, could care less. And they'll they'll use an a- Apple iPhone 10 for the next 10 years. They could care less. But most of us are on an upgrade cycle. So anyway, I, I don't know. It's The leadership is there and it's crazy. We thought Apple was going to break down and it broke out. 
and it broke out in a big way. And I think you got to be respectful of price. Well, have a look as at Broadcom right as well. Broadcom after market up 11%, that stock's flying as well. So another on the AI front that, that, that I think works quite well uh, in that situation. Let's just yeah. quickly, let's change it. I, I still like the space. Um, you know, it's, it's really showing leadership once again. Yeah, market concentration, poor poor breadth. People say it's cool. Yeah, it's bring out these these yeah these market internals charts and say market's going down because of poor internals. Where it looks really funky and really 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 sexy, but it doesn't make you any money. Um, Bank of Japan quickly while we got here, uh, we have got that coming through tomorrow Friday. Um, talking about cutting back on JGB purchases. Is it going to be a yen event risk? I I don't think it will because it's been so t- so well telegraphed, but. But but I'm just going to say this: um, the amount would uh, it will obviously matter. Uh, I can tell you that our whole community is going to be up for that event. All the Europeans are staying up for for the BOJ, so we're going to be hustling and bustling, like hanging on every word. And I just need to mark one level: 155 in the dollar yen. That's the level of support that is so critical. For the next cool forty eight hours, we're talking about support. Period. Let's we're talking about support. Let's go into the charts that matter. Let's go to that's the setup. I'll go first. I'll go first. Uh, Aussie dollar, yeah. bring it up because we've got the employment numbers coming through um, very very shortly in Australia. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to be too much of a, a, a driver. They are very important to the RBA. So the uh, labour market is very much at the forefront of their thinking when they're setting policy. But if you have a look at interest rate futures in Australia, they're not pricing anything really this whole year. So, um, you know, we'd have to see an absolute calamity of a number to to, to move rate settings there as well. Uh, and I think really what you're seeing is the US dollar working there. So, yeah, when the US dollar is under pressure, people looking to go into the high beta plays, you know, your, your, your knockies, your stockies, your Aussie dollar kiwi, those kind of worlds. Um, what we've seen, and, and you pointed out in earlier, is that we've got this huge level of resistance at six. 67 cents. It's been the place where the scalpers have just been happy to just leave limit orders to sell every single time. Up it goes, bang, sell the market, down she goes. Um, it happens again, and I think you know that's that's for the scalpers out there. You've got a really, really clear level to to, to work against uh, for for more sort of swing sort of time frames. Um, you know, waiting for a close above that level for me is is absolutely critical uh, because you know I like the structure. You've had the, the break of the downtrend. We've had a bit of consolidation after the rally, a break of that level, and I think you know the momentum traders out there will be piling into this one. I think you buy that. Um, and, you, and you, you hold for as long as it takes you out. So just put a five-day moving average under it. When price closes below it, then you know get out. But for me, this is a really interesting setup. We're banging on that ceiling, one for the scalpers, but also when it breaks, one for the momentum heads. All right. Well, I, li- I, I know that's a big level, and I'm glad you pointed it out so everybody knows that's a big level as well. You know, another big level is going to be this Euro Max. Chris, this thing is – well, first of all, Whoa. the Mexican peso – We've discussed it over the last couple of weeks to about the, how weak it is. To the, to this, the wood house. Me- to the wood house. Chop, it chop, is, chop, you chop. know, and, and dollar max is trading above 1850. And that's it. This is in, in a positive, this is in a positive carry environment. Imagine what happens if stocks actually pull back a little bit. This Mexican peso could really get destroyed. You'll notice that's the post COVID lockdown high that's on the far upper left hand corner of your screen. We hit that trend line. This is the Euro Mex. And if we squeeze past that and we get past that trend line, we get past this 24% retracement, I think that it is setting up for a big, big squeeze higher. Uh, I like it. I like the way it looks. I like the fact that we're getting all these Mexican uh, headlines regarding this this non-business friendly environment that Mexico might be in. People are nervous, Chris. And like I said, all you need is see, to see stocks start to come down a little bit, the Euromex is going to be on a tear. So I'm buying dips, but I think that trend line should be watched by everybody in the market. It's right interesting. Now. I mean, I think you've got euro issues with the French French uh, elections coming up and, and that's causing spread widening to play through and that that's it impacting. But yeah, I do think that the, the MEX is a really interesting one. The, we're trying to price risk and certainty in Mexico, and it's very difficult to do so. They're, they're putting, going to be putting through constitutional reform, which is going to cause you know, foreign and direct investment to to flee Mexico effectively. And so we're pricing risk around Mexico and it's very difficult to do. So I like to trade higher as well, even though you've got those political risks. Let's go to gold. 
the yellow metal has lost its shine. The headline writers write, mm. but yeah, look, we've got this. Uh, we've got a really very, very, very nicely defined tra- a trading range playing through, uh, and I think it's working every time. I mean, you've got two year yields on the treasury side, which are, are trading a, a really tight range, and I, I think that, that that's probably defining the gold market for now. Um, you know, the Chinese are pulling back on. Uh, buying or increasing their golds as a percentage of reserve, which is a, a bit of a gold negative. But you know you've got the dollar pretty whippy. Um, the investment case for gold at the moment is is somewhat lacking. Um, you know the economic fragility hedge is is not there right now. I think longer term it goes higher. But right now we've got a very very clearly defined range as we have in the two year treasury five five percent to four seventy. So we saw that again buyer stepping in at the bottom end of the range. Um, if we can break through that green horizontal line, which comes around 23, 25, uh, maybe we'll make a bit of a move higher in the moment. But the moment, I think, you know, for the gold balls, the investment case um, from a fundamental perspective uh, is 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 not quite there. We're, there's reasons to buy, there's reasons to sell. It's not particularly strong either way. Uh, the price action reflects that. I'm, I'm happy to continue trading the range. But once this range breaks, then I think, you know, that will be, that will be the start of a new trend. And I think that needs to be respected as well. Well, you know, Chris, I've got a chart. First of all, I love that. I love this range that's set up in gold, but I have a chart that's almost can match that. Ooh. And I'm going to take you guys over to the Bitcoin. Very, very tight trading range. 66,000 to 72,000. You just jot those numbers down. 66,000, 72,000. We break below 66,000. We should trade back down below 60,000 towards the 200 DMA or maybe that channel bottom. But we break above 72,000. And then, Chris, you you talked about a big cup and handle, uh, you know, last week. And I think it looks like a cup and handle on a weekly chart. We break 72,000. We might be trading up north of 80,000. So I'm I'm not going to uh, step out on a ledge and tell you which way I think it's going to go because I don't know. I'm going to let the range and price dictate and drive the direction because I can make a technical argument for either. But that little red box 66,000 has been allowing buyers to step in, 72,000 sellers have been stepping in. Just let that range play out. And once it plays out and once we break out, I think you can find some really good trading opportunities. And that's why we call it a setup, Chris. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. And if you have a look at the inflows into the Bitcoin cash ETFs at the moment, they are very, very high. They're staggering, actually, to be fair. Um, lots of talk of people going long the ETF and short the futures as a, as a, as a trade and and and. Yeah, trade in the contango, but um, yeah, that's an interesting one in itself. I haven't got a chart here. But one, I, one I think everyone needs to keep on the radar as well. Ahead of the Bank of Japan is the is the Nikkei, the JPN two two five. We are literally in a tight range. It's coiling. I reckon it's ready to have a big breakout as well. So put that one on your radar. Anyway, let's go to play of the day. I'm going for a bit of a cheeky pairs trade, long short. Let's 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 head head it up with the uh, the long tech. Light tech, Woo-hoo! long tech. Um, yeah, it's just up, up and away. I mean, you know, the, the problem with the US 30 and the Dow is, is that you've got you know, 9% of the variance of the market, the weighting of the market is, is dictated by United Health. So it's it, that's why it, it's a lower beta market. And, and you, you you look at in, index composition, yeah, there's no NVIDIA in the Dow. Uh, that may change soon. But even though, even if you were to put NVIDIA in the market, which is the talk, then you know, they're going to have a very low weighting because they've got such a low price post stock split as well. So, you know, if you look at it, it's a very defensive market relative to the NAS. Uh, the NAS obviously very tech weighted. Tech's on fire at the moment. Banks are under a lot of pressure. You know, we're seeing the XLF really underperforming at the moment. Uh, relative energy is underperforming. So keep that concentration risk towards tech. Um, the way I like to do that is, is just to be long the NASDAQ as, a, as, as my long leg. Using getting them working out the notional there and using that same notional amount to be short the, the US 30. Look, it's it's hot, it, it probably needs a little bit of a pullback. I'd use that as an entry point. Um, but I think this this continues to go higher. I think the NASDAQ, relative to a lot of these US markets, uh, is going to continue to outperform. Apple's looking good, Nvidia looks good, pullback's going to be limited. Love this higher. All right, well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, that looks pretty damn strong if you ask me. Yeah. All right. It does. So, hey, let's go to my play of the day, and let me let me be the first one to say uh, I was actually short dollars into last week's play of the day, thanks to the European um, uh, election situation. That didn't work out so hot for me, and and that you know I had some uh, I had some good money on the line, and you know, but that's all right. We don't win them all, do we, Chris? So we don't. This 
Well, this play of the day is the Canadian yen. And I do not have any skin in the game just yet. But I told you guys, I'm really focused on the yen right now ahead of the BOJ. Um, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but I know the breaking points of this particular chart. This is a, an ascending wedge in the Canadian yen, had a false breakout to the upside, and it's now making lower highs. Now, we are arguably making higher lows, so it's not a reversal yet, but just look at the 50 DMA, 50 daily moving average, just not an exponential, a simple moving average. It's got the support. We break through that 50 DMA, that means we're testing that trend line support. We break that wedge support. Things can get kind of ugly. And like I said, I'm not, I'm going in the BOJ without any preconceived notions with this particular pair. But should they just suggest that they might, um, you know, uh, 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 monetary policy, they might, uh, you know, um, speed it up a little bit more. Sorry, it's late in the day for me. Uh, you might see some yen strength. So this one is definitely on the radar for me, and it is going to be my play of the day. Well, as I used to say, as we used to say in the in the trading pits in the late nineties, real men go long the yen. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can say that. Uh, any- no, he doesn't really mean that, guys. He doesn't. <laughs> um, anyway, let's uh, let's switch gears. And thank you very much for everyone for watching today. Um, we'll see you back next week for more of the trade off. 